Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Business Growth Show, where we talk about all components of business and how to utilize them for exponential growth. My name is Ethan Cassiotis. I'm a serial entrepreneur, international speaker, results strategist, business coach, mentor, and consultant. After over 14 years of being in business and running multiple companies, I felt called to start this show. I see many people struggling to start or grow a business, which is why I want to help entrepreneurs achieve success in business quicker, more effectively, and sustainably. Today, I have an awesome guest. He is a success strategist, global speaker, author, plus an investor in business, property, and entertainment. Welcome, Reggie Batts, and thank you for being on my show. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm great. Thanks a lot, Reggie. How about yourself? I'm going fantastic and I'm getting better. Awesome. <laughs> That's what it's all about. I love the positivity. Um, so you're a very successful entrepreneur. And, and for those people who don't know who you are, uh, please introduce yourself by telling us your life story. My life story. Wow. Wow. Life story. That can, that, that can take a little time. I'll condense it in a couple of minutes. Um, well, you know, at, at a very young age of 21, I was fresh out of university. Um, you know, I come from a really good family, perfect parents. Um, my family is just a very close, close family. We never had any issues or anything like that. I come from a really good family, good values, very strong values. Um, you know, hard work, uh, not hard work, but smart work, as my parents would always say. Um, they weren't a big believer in hard work. They were a big believer in smart work. And that's kind of what they distilled in me. And I met Tony Robbins at the age of 21 and I saw him on TV. Uh, one night and I was fresh out of university. My parents had sold the house that I was born and raised in. And I felt like he was speaking directly to me. I felt like it was just he and I, right? And because what he was talking about kind of related to what I was going through at that time. You know, I didn't know what I was gonna do. I didn't know what direction I wanted to go in. Do I wanna be an attorney? You know, am I gonna go to law school? What, what is the case gonna be? I didn't know, you know, unfortunately after university or college, they don't give you a, a manual that says, okay, this is the next step. So you have to kind of, I was kind of trying to figure out things myself. And uh, I moved to San Diego, this where I live now. I, I moved to San Diego and uh, to, to meet Tony Robbins and to, to get my foot in the door. And to make a long story short, I made it happen. And one of the very first things that I did when I got there, because he teaches this in the products, uh, he says, you really have to, you know, whoever you want to become, seek out the people who are doing it. Now, that's so cliche, we hear that all the time. Every successful person says that, or any, any person who wants to be successful says that. But I didn't hear anything like that back then. And he told me that, and uh, I thought it was absolutely amazing. So what I did, I called Human Resources, and I said, I wanna know who the top producers are in the organization. And they gave me a list of 10 names. And I said, out of these 10 people, who are the top five? And she told me who the top five were. And I did whatever I could to really become friends with those individuals. I went to lunch with them. If they came in the morning, if they came into the office at eight, I would come in at 7.30. If they left at five, I would stay until 5.30. And I just picked their brains. Um, any, I, I, whatever disciplines they had, I adopted those disciplines. And I became uh, one of the top producers in less than six months. And I'm 21 years old. And this was back then. And I made 108, you know, $108,000 my very first, uh, in less than a year. I thought it was absolutely amazing. And I didn't even know that was good money then because I've never had a job in my life. Um, my parents really wanted me to focus on my studies and my education and all of that. Um, so I didn't have to work or anything. And uh, I just never understood what working was. I didn't know what good money was versus, versus bad money. And, and I learned that I was, you know, making good money, who knew? <laughs> and I didn't have any bills or anything. So I was just having a great time. Um, and I really worked my, my way through the ranks and um, very respectable company, um, very respectable people. And where I live now, um, or the first place that I bought when I, when I moved to San Diego, I still own that place. And it's not too far from where the offices um, of Tony Robbins um, is actually located. So some of my best friends still work there and I still communicate with them on an ongoing basis. And it was just a rewarding situation. So I spent over 10 years uh, working with Tony Robbins. My last position there was general manager of product sales and distribution. Um, I was in charge of moving all the products that we sold on TV, on the infomercial and QVC. I'm not sure if you have QVC it's a, or the Home Shopping Network, but we had to move all of those products in-house. And then I had to hire a fulfillment company to take on all of Tony's uh, products. So it was a 
big, big task. It was a daunting task. I didn't know what I was getting myself into. And, and I later found out that the position that I had, no one wanted it. <laughs> because there, there were many people who had the opportunity to, uh, to be promoted to that position. And uh, I just had the drive and I didn't know anything about the negativity that was going on in that position. I didn't know anything about people. I just saw it as an opportunity. And due to that, not having references, I was able to go in there and really make something happen really, really big. And by the way, I didn't do it on my own. I had a great staff of people working with me. I had a fantastic mentorship there because I, you know, the person that I reported to was just very, very supportive. And it was just a great environment. And I reached a point where, you know, I was there over 10 years and, I, and it went by really, really fast. I was a baby when I went there and I was very naive. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, I didn't have any references for anything good or bad. And it just happened. And uh, after 10 years, um, I did very, very well. And I just felt that I was, you know, I felt that I was maxed. And I had no clue what I was going to do, but I just wanted to take a year off, which is what I did. And my girlfriend and I, at the time, we, uh, we flew to uh, New Zealand. <laughs> and we were in New Zealand, and I started getting phone calls from all these other speakers who wanted me to work with them because a lot of them were based in San Diego. Deepak Chopra had a center in San Diego. They were trying to recruit me. Uh, Brian Tracy, he's located in San Diego to this day. Um, they were trying to recruit me as well. As well. And by the way, this was in 2008. What was unique about 2008? Yeah, global financial crisis. <laughs> global financial crisis. Everything was going wrong. Lots of uncertainty. In America, we had a new president. Unemployment was you know, record high. The financial market, the real estate market, everything was just falling apart. I didn't focus on any of those things. And that's another thing that he taught me. You know, when, when, when things are going really chaotic, that's the time that successful people are looking for opportunities, right? Like now, there's a lot of opportunities going on right now with COVID-19. And if you can just, you know, take that wall down and you'll be able to see those opportunities. And the only way you can take the wall down is if you change your mindset, if you escape from the fear and, um, and, and just have the belief that, you know, in order for you to survive, my philosophy is in order for you to survive, you need food, you need air, and you need water. But there's one more thing that you need, and that's growth. You need growth. And I really think that's the fourth component to really um, surviving. You, you have to grow because growth gives you fulfillment. And, uh, you know, success without fulfillment is failure. Tony Robbins says that all the time. So it does, and I, I know people who are wildly successful, but they are the most unhappy people. They don't have any fulfillment for whatever reason, right? And that's definitely not success. That's something that I did not want. And I saw a lot of successful people who just weren't happy, or maybe they were in a poor relationship, or maybe they had some other areas of their life where they were failing in, which sort of hurt their business or whatever. So... Um, I believe that you need to be fulfilled in all areas of your life, in your relationships, in your business, in your finances, um, in your health, all of those things. Because if one of those things is off track, it can spoil everything. So you have to, it's, you know, it's, it's like trying to drive a car with only three wheels. You know, if that one thing is missing, it's going to affect the, you know, it's going to affect everything else. Yeah, definitely. That's uh, an amazing story and great points. And then I guess, you know, from that time after Tony, then you were talking about these different people that were going to work with you. And then I guess talk about that next stage in your um, life career. There. The next stage is I received a call from um, a friend. Uh, we weren't close friends, but she, she was um, at Tony Robbins as well. She had left before I did. And she told me about, um, uh, and she called me while I was in New Zealand. And she was telling me about a guy by the name of JT Fox. I had no idea who he was. And I was, pretty much said not interested. I have no idea who this guy is. And she was just being very, very persistent. And there was another guy who knows me and knew JT as well. He was in contact with me too. And, um, you know, I said to myself, wow, Deepak Chopra, I know who he is. Uh, Brian Tracy, I know who he is. Uh, even Ken Blanchard. I'm not sure if you know who Ken Blanchard is, but he's in San Diego also. He wrote the book, The One Minute Manager. I was a big fan of his. Um, he's in San Diego also, and they were trying to recruit me. And again, this was in 2008. This is crazy with everything that was going on then. And I remember I, I Googled JT Fox. Actually, <laughs> I didn't Google him. I Yahooed <laughs> JT Fox. And, uh, and I, you know, this guy pops up, young guy, uh, you know, very silly smile on his face, and the tie was kind of crooked. 
And I said, no way, no way. And she just, she was just very, very persistent. So um, I actually left New Zealand early and I flew back to uh, Los Angeles. Many people have heard me speak. I, I tell this story, so I'm leaving out some pretty big parts, but just for the sake of time, I flew back to uh, Los Angeles from Auckland. And, um, and then I met JT and, and I remember we were in his house. It was just the two of us. And, uh, you know, the first thing I said to myself was, you know, I'm trying to think, is he arrogant or is he, you know, very, very confident, <laughs> you know, but it, 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 he's very confident. And I don't know what I was, I didn't, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. And uh, because it was basically just he and I, and uh, he just had this crazy, crazy vision. And, um, and it, it, it kind of reminded me of Tony Robbins because I wasn't there in the very beginning of Tony Robbins when he was first creating his brand. But I can imagine that Tony Robbins was similar in his way of thinking and maybe they took different roads to get there, but that passion. And he had a lot of passion and we just made it happen. And uh, here I am over 10 years later, <laughs> you know, so, you know, 10 years, Tony Robbins, 10 years, you know, JT Fox. And uh, I, I don't like to move around too much and, and, uh, and I, I like to, you know, my, my philosophy is that as long as I am growing, as long as I am growing, I'm good. When I stop growing, um, it becomes a problem. Even if I'm in a situation that's a great situation, right? Um, I'm almost, I struggle with it because I teach people that if they're not growing to change their environment or change their situation so they continue to grow. But I've also learned that we can create things to challenge ourselves to grow within the environment we're in if we don't feel like we're growing. We can create things to you know, really push us and really help us to grow no differently than going to the gym and building the muscle um, in our bodies. We have to, we have to build the, the muscle in our brain and the muscle in our mindset and the muscle in our development, personal development and, and all of that as well. Yeah, definitely. I, I love that. What, what, a, what an amazing story. And I really resonated with, with all of that. And, you know, you, the amount of experience and people that you've worked with, like Tony, you know, one of the best life coaches in the world, um, you know, massive in, in um, you know, the crowds and the events that he does. And then, you know, now JT Fox, one of the best, you know, business wealth coaches in the world. And, um, you know, sort of both of those two angles um, is, is an amazing combination. And, and then that coupled with, you know, you with your mindset, which is very important, obviously, as well with, um, with business, you know, to, to push yourself forward and to grow. That's a pretty amazing story, Reggie. So thank you for... Uh, and John Asareth as well. I'm not sure if you know John Asareth. John Asareth is from the movie The Secret. Yeah. Um, we became great friends with him and I actually worked with him for a little bit uh, as well. And he's, he was another one of my mentors um, that I still know uh, to this day. The funny thing is, we, I was recently in Colorado and I was at the store and I ran into John Asareth and, and I didn't even see him. He saw me, he's like, oh my God, it was, it was so amazing. So, you know, having, having giants and being able to lean on those giants, people who have done it and they do it, they continuously grow it's almost seamlessly. I know it's hard, but they, they make it look almost seamlessly. And uh, those are the types of people that I really like to, uh, to lean on. And, I also hope that I can be that for someone else. I hope that I'm being that person uh, for someone else because I want other people to grow as well, especially now because there's so much going, there's so much going on right now. And I know there's so much pain and hurt and agony for a lot of people. And, uh, but you know, on the other side, there's a lot of great things going on for people. There's a lot of new businesses that are starting. I know a lot of businesses are going out of business, but there's a lot of new businesses that are coming into the marketplace and which is really, really good. So um, I think when, when we're on the other side of this, it's going to be a really good thing. And uh, if nothing else, if there's a silver lining in everything that we're going through right now, I think there's many. But if, if there's one I think we can all relate to is that it's changed us and it's helped us to reprioritize uh, things in our life. Because things that I thought were a priority to me um, three or four months ago, um, maybe they're not as important as I thought they were. And I've re prioritize things and I think that's why I have a different level of happiness in my life now and fulfillment I'm always I was always happy but I think that um, you know when you start to get to know yourself like I have over these last couple of months and you spend time with people that uh, you were supposed to spend time with but you didn't and now we're forced to do that um, it's, it's just really really powerful you know and the relationships that we've had in the past that we haven't really you know had a chance to communicate with people we haven't had a chance to communicate with in a while and you start opening up those relationships again and uh, it's, it's a really good thing. So I never want to be too busy where 
I don't have those things uh, going on because I learned that it's those things that um, give me the fulfillment that I truly desire. Yeah, I completely agree with you. It's so important to understand ourselves and how we look at situations. You know, there's always opportunities in things. You know, there's always great when there's, you know, if something bad happens, it's like, okay, what's the good that come out of this or what, what can I do instead of it? And, and, exactly. I, and I think I, I love the, the points of, you know, the people that you're mentioning and, you know, Tony, I know says this and, and as you have said is that, you know, you want to model yourself of people that have, you know, achieved what you want to achieve because basically... Yeah you get there quicker. Um, you know, you can do it yourself, but it could take you 10, 20 years. Why take that long in your life when, you know, we only have a, a limited amount of time in this world when you can go to the people that have achieved it, that you really resonate with and, um, you know, learn from the best. And then that way, you know, you create that momentum and then that exponential growth. And then, um, you know, you can really create your destiny um, from there. So it's, um, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It's really awesome. Um, yeah. I, um, I've only been to San Diego once when I was young. I went with my parents when I was 11 years old and I did go to SeaWorld. Um, but um, that's all I really remember of San Diego at the time. Uh, oh, beautiful. It's beautiful here. Uh, it's, 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 it's wonderful. And that's something else that I've been doing. I've been really, uh, I mean, I'm, I've been a healthy guy pretty much all my life, but I'm really healthy now <laughs> because I'm really, really, uh, you know, taking care of myself and my diet and, you know, the food I eat and, and, and all of that. And, um, and I lost weight. And I'm like, you know, a couple of people were like, have you lost weight? And I'm like, yeah, I have lost weight. I did not lose weight purposely. Um, I'm, I, I, it's just because I'm doing a lot of cardio and I'm going to replace, I'm replacing that weight with muscle. But I had even that, you know, taking care of our health and taking care of our diet and all of these things, you know, the virus has really um, made me think about those things. And um, I, I'm really uh, happy about that. Yeah, definitely. Health is extremely important. I'm, I'm very health conscious. I've been to, for many years and I think, you know, there's different components to that as well. Obviously the food that you eat, you want to try and eat you know, a lot of raw, nice, you know, vegetables and fruits and, um, you know, there's different types of diets and things, but um, potentially cutting down on meat and having more plant-based type things as well. Um, but, you know, each to their own of, of what works with everybody. Um, you know, I like to have a few sort of little things like I have a super green in the morning. I, I like to intermittent fast and have a little bit of just a little super green in the morning. So I don't eat something that's, that's me. Um, and I feel Say like super greens, super greens. Yeah. It's yeah, all, I do, I do that. I do that as well. Yeah. It's uh, a, yeah, yeah, it's a ma massive nutrients, you know, for that little bit that you take and um, really alkalizes, alkalizes the body. Absolutely. And, and don't you feel like you have more energy? Definitely. I focus more, I have more energy, I'm more vibrant. Not that I needed all those things anymore because I have a lot of that, but it, it's just, I'm like bouncing off the walls now. It's a good thing. Yeah. yeah. And I think one part of health that a lot of people don't actually think about is the water you drink as well, which is really important because uh, depending on where you live is obviously a little bit different on what the tap right. water or what the filters are, but you know, there's certain contaminants in water, you know, fluoride is a neurotoxin, a lot of people are saying. So you want to really get rid of these things. So whether that's you buying sort of boxed water or you get a, you know, a proper filter, a really good one, like Absolutely. a reverse osmosis filter, um, you know, in your house with an alkalizer, then, you know, that's something that I take. And you actually feel the difference um, in, in your energy and just your health and, and your clarity and everything like that. It's, it's a Absolutely. Pretty, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Very true. I, I, I can relate to everything you're saying. Yeah, that's awesome. So um, I guess from when you were working with Tony Robbins, what were your biggest learnings you think that came out of that? Wow, the list, is, the list goes high. <laughs> uh, um, you know, I didn't know what limiting beliefs were until I met Tony Robbins. And I remember we were in the conference room and uh, there were maybe 12 of us in the conference room with him. And he wanted me to write down all of my limiting beliefs. I'm like, what's that? <laughs> and he says, he had to explain what that was. And I said, oh my goodness, this is the easiest assignment I've ever had because my list was so long. It was so long. And um, I remember he looked at, he's like, are you done? Are you done? I'm like, no, I'm not quite done yet. The list goes on. <laughs> and uh, I remember he took the, uh, he took the paper and he balled it up, threw it in the trash, and said, you no longer have to live this way. And that was, that was a moment for me. I mean, I remember as if it was uh, if it were yesterday. 
And um, I never went back to those limiting beliefs that I had. And I think that's what was the driving force that uh, really helped me push through. I mean, I had limiting beliefs working with him, you know, and, and how is that even possible? But um, so that was a learning. Um, other lear I, I learned how to, um, I was a very shy guy. You know, the shyness went away because I, I think a lot of people are shy because they lack confidence. And I don't want to say that I lacked confidence. I think that I just had an issue trying to figure out if I deserved it, right? If I deserved it. And once I knew that I did deserve it, that was a real eye opener for me. And I just did whatever it took to, to really make it happen. Yeah. But I learned a lot about my, you know, about the mindset and, and really aligning yourself with great people. All these things that we talk about today, all these simple things that we all know about, but in that environment, I was forced to live it because not only were we supposed to teach this stuff, we had to live it. And if we didn't leave, live it, we were out, you know, because we could, we could hurt his brand. So it was, it was, what I liked about it is that it really, really challenged me and it really, really pushed me to grow. And then the mentors that I had at that organization were really, really amazing. I still talk to them today. Um, one gentleman we had, his name is Jim Miller. I was talking to him about a month ago and I was intimidated at first and a lot of people did not like him. And I wanted to know why they didn't like him because the two people that were in his position before, no one liked them either. So I said to myself, hmm, is it really that they don't like them or are they just afraid to be challenged by these individuals? And that was the key. And he really, really pushed me. And, and he's the one that really uh, changed my paradigm of how I was thinking to take our revenue to the next level. Because I had this fixed mindset that the revenue that we were creating, we were just creating enough to meet our budget, you know? But uh, he had me think a lot bigger. And I said, well, that's great. I, I can take this philosophy, but what about my staff? How am I going to show them that? And he's like, well, you just have to be the example. And he's like, you know, how, however you want them to show up, you show up 10 times better and you're going to become the example. And I guarantee you things are going to change. And that's exactly what happened. You know, I showed up differently. I showed up at a level 10 and um, because it was important for me to do that. And I, I got the result and it was really, really amazing. So when things like that happen, um, I'm convinced that if you're working with the right people, you have the right people in your life, you have the right mentor in your life, um, and, you, and, and, and you do whatever it takes to make it happen, and you, have, and you have the right mindset, you can accomplish anything you want. And it may not happen in the time that you want to accomplish it, but you definitely will accomplish it. Oftentimes, if you don't accomplish it, it's because maybe your why wasn't strong enough, and you didn't have that, that passion as you got closer to achieving it. Um, you know how it is you have this goal and as you get closer to it, you say, maybe you say to yourself, hmm, maybe I don't want that, you know, or you, there's a girl that you like and you go on that first date and you say, hmm, maybe I don't like that, you know, <laughs> so that's kind of how it was for me. Yeah, I, I love that. I completely agree, Reggie. And, you know, the mindset, um, those limiting beliefs, when you actually understand that and, you know, I like to say is like, you know, you're never going to, it's never going to be perfect. Your mindset, right? Things always pop up. And I, oh, I like to yeah, say, is, you know, I, I like to catch it. That's the way I talk about it. Then I flip it and I, you know, and then I say actually who I want to become a believer that I already am that right now. And that's, you know, really important. And, and I think your other point of, um, you know, the environment that you're in, I think that's so important. Like you hear about, you know, the five people you spend, you know, the most time with is, is who you become. And, and then, but even from an organizational sense, the culture and that sort of drive that, you know, that peak performance type culture that really, you know, can lift a lot of people up in there or, you know, can have the opposite effect, uh, you know, on a business as well, if they're not sort of implementing that. So that environment's um, really awesome. And that's like what I aim to, you know, to put in my um, companies and I'm, I'm sure you're doing for yourself. And, and not only does that help us in the business, but it also helps the people because the people grow within it as well. So it's... Um, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely really awesome um so i guess um from following that then and obviously you've been um with jt uh fox since you know the start of his journey um what learnings or what are the biggest things that you took after that so obviously you know you, you grew from tony and then now you're, you're on that new path now what were some of the, the big things that have come from that well when i made the transition from tony um I had this phenomenal mindset, like, you know, it's just everything that's going on here was just, it was just, you know, all positive and, and, and all of that. And I felt like I can do anything, whatever that was. 
And I was literally going to take a year off. I wanted to take a year off and just do nothing. Um, not because I'm lazy, but just because I, I've, I was doing so much. You know, keep in mind, fresh out of university, I went straight to work with Tony Robbins. So there was no lapse there. I moved to San Diego and moved, you know, worked with Tony Robbins. And I was traveling a lot with him and uh, lots of different things. So I just wanted to take a little time off. And um, that time was actually a month. It wasn't even a full year, it was a month because I met JT Fox. And uh, learnings from him, what, what I learned from him is now that I had my mindset, I said, now he had me start thinking about wealth, right? Because, you know, that's a word that I didn't use too often when I was with Tony Robbins. It was also very, it was always very transformational. But um, I, with JT, I've just never, you know, he's a, he's a machine. I, I, I can't. He's a, he's a freaking machine, you know, he really is. And uh, the, just the discipline, I mean, he's a very disciplined guy. Uh, he and Tony, in my opinion, people ask me all the time when I'm at JT Box events speaking, they ask me all the time because I talk about Tony, and they ask me, what is the difference between JT Fox and Tony Robbins? And the first thing I say is that they're total opposites right? Uh, Tony Robbins is like, oh, it's going to be okay. You know, give me a hug. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be okay. Let's talk about this. Let's make it happen. And JT's like, I just want to make you successful. <laughs> you know, I don't want the tears. I don't want to hug you. I just want to make you successful, right? And, those, and, and, and that's, you know, no nonsense, no fluff, just straight to it. And I think they're both good things to have. And I was just fortunate that I had the chance to meet and work with both of them. You know, um, what a gift to work with two giants uh, in the industry. And I'm extremely grateful for that. I'm, a, I'm grateful to, to both of them. And I probably, have a, um, I probably have a different relationship with JT than I had with Tony Robbins as well. I mean, Tony Robbins was untouchable. I mean, we hardly saw the guy. You know, he was rarely in the office. And when he was in the office, he had his own elevator, you know, to, to go to his floor. He had a whole floor to himself. So um, it was a very, very uh, structured corporate, corporate environment. Whereas JT, I don't consider that corporate. And, quick, you know, you can make this quick decisions when you're not in corporate. You know, oftentimes in corporate, it has to be approved by five different people before there was a consensus that this is the right thing to do. Um, but JT, you know, he comes up with an idea, boom, next day, implement it, you know, and, and there's no right or wrong to either one of those. It's just two different styles that they have. And I learned to really adapt to both of them and clearly understanding both of them. Yeah, that, that's really awesome. And I guess I've got not exactly the same experience, but some ex similar experience to you where I was able to go to, um, you know, Unleash the Power Within UPW, Tony Robbins event. And that was really um, transformational in me and, and um, you know, um, enhancing my mindset and breaking through things and, and um, yeah, the energy he brings and everything like that was really awesome. Um, and, um, you know, I always look at, you know, when, when I say to people, I had a friend, right, um, that, that came there and he was a bit skeptical and was like, oh, I don't know, I'm just going to, you know, I'm not going to write notes or do anything. And I had to really change his mindset. I said, listen, we, we, you're, you're going here. We're going here to take the most out of this. Be as open as possible. Take everything playful out after you can decide about what you want to take from it, because that makes a massive difference. Because a lot of people go into these things and they're very closed and whatever. They don't do it. And then they, they wonder why they don't really, you know, change their lives as much. So I went in after the first day, he was going as hard as me, you know, and he completely changed his life. He left his job um, that week. He quit and, you know, did some big things. And, that's for him. But, you know, for me, um, you know, going through that just gives you that drive and then, you know, implementing the things as well after that you learn, going back through that and going, okay, how can I ingrain, you know, the key learnings and the key things that right. I did? That was really powerful for me. And then meeting JT um, and, um, you know, the first time it's, you know, JT is awesome. And like he, like you said, he's like a no fluff, you know, straight down the line guy. And, um, there's, you know, there's a bit of polarity there. Some people love him, some people hate him. That's like everybody, right? Um, but I love that, that, you know, he's the type of guy that, you know, he will tell you the truth, the hard truth when he coaches you. And not a lot of coaches and mentors do that. You know, they like to sort of play it nice and everything like that. And JT's like, I'm going to give it to you straight. And, you know, um, you know, I employ you to have the right mindset to take this on the right way so that you can actually grow right from that. And, um, see the real thing. And um, yeah, it was amazing to see 
you know, the way he coaches, um, you know, like just reading people on the spot, knowing exactly like exactly what they were. And, um, you know, he does it off, you know, off the cuff, like everything. He was doing multiple coaches, you know, on, on social media recently, just to show everybody as well, even when it's not live. And, um, yeah, and it's, it's really amazing. And then, yeah. And then obviously JT's got that, you know, wealth and business background. So it's like, you got the good mindset, but you need the strategies, the skills and everything to know, okay, what do I want to do to, to achieve in this world? And, you know, and I see business as the, the best vehicle in my eyes, because you have the control, the control is up to you. Um, and, and business isn't for everybody. Being an entrepreneur isn't for everybody as well. Right. Um, you know, some people, um, like the, um, security, you know, of having a job and everything like that, but, what are, if even if you're not an entrepreneur, what a great entrepreneur can do, and they build the culture that they do, is that they can bring the people that work for them up, you know, and then that way they love working for them as well. So it's sort of it, it's a two prong approach of, of of building that. So um, you know, and then that way you can really create um, you know that life that you want if that's the path. And and it's not going to be easy as we know to go down that, but. Um, but it can be simple and by learning from the best, um, you know, you can get there a lot quicker and, and learn from their failures. So you don't have to make all these failures and, and that along the way. So it's, um, it's really you live that way. You, you attract such great people, you know, in your life. I mean, the people that I have in my life, um, I, have, well, I have a very, very small, 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 small circle of people who truly know me. Um, but you, you just attract the right people and good people, you know, and people who don't really, you know, for no other reason, except for the fact that they want to help you. Um, that's really, really amazing. And that's what I aspire to, to you know, to, to, to be for other people, especially now, you know, there's so many people, as I stated earlier, they need help, and maybe they don't have the resources to get that help. And, uh, you know, I, I, in California, I, I was watching something that was really, that really bothered me. And, and that's the fact that the suicide rate over the last couple of months in California has just skyrocketed. And I said to myself, man, I don't, I don't understand that. You know, I, I, I can't fathom why someone would do that to themselves. And, um, and I said to myself, I want to help, you know, because it, it bothered me. It really bothered me. And I think one of the reasons why it bothered me is because I have two close friends, um, one from high school and one from university who committed suicide. One committed suicide as, you know, early last year. He jumped in front of a train here in, in San Diego. And that really bothered me. I don't talk about stuff like this because um, I just don't, I'm a very private person and I don't even, I just don't talk about stuff like that. But my point being, um, starting Monday, I'm actually taking a course because I'm gonna volunteer four hours of my time per week. Um, speaking to these people you know i have a great mindset and I, i'm a mindset coach and i said hey how can i work how can i use my talent to help some of these people so i can feel like i'm helping and i think so many people are doing that so many people with all these issues we have going on they're asking themselves what can i do to help and the people who are struggling like i was is because we feel helpless we can't do anything about it yeah we can tweet something or post something on social media or put a video out but we have to what can we do to physically help and giving money that's so easy i could have given some money or something like that but I, I wanted to use my time to do it and uh so on monday i start taking the course i didn't know you had to take a course <laughs> I, I had no idea you had to take a course on how to do that i say hey i'm good <laughs> they're like no you have to take the course so um i'm gonna take this course for a couple of weeks and uh and then i'm gonna start helping these individuals that's awesome reggie by the way i don't say that um to glorify myself i say that hoping other people will do the same yeah that that's also Rishi, and, that, and that's what i was sort of um i guess going to say is that um you know however much we give you know to, uh, what, you know back to people is normally what we receive as well you know it's sort of like a universal energy thing that that it works out like that and and that's amazing and um you know i think once we get into these positions where we start to get more successful is you know you start to have that sort of philanthropic um aspect where it's like how can i do these things so that that's awesome reggie great to hear and aren't you, but aren't you glad of that i mean that's that i think that's, it's such a it's such a great thing i see other people doing it you know other people who have you know influence um a lot of influence and and they're out there doing things not just talking about it but actually doing it and and i think that's that's really good i mean we're all in this together you know it's not like we can hop on a plane and go to another country to get away from it we're all in this together 
and uh, it's going to take all of us to get out of it. Definitely. Um, so what specific part of our mindset do you think is the most important and why? All of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. <laughs> um, okay. Well, let's right? I mean, all, all of it, I mean, because there's, there's, I mean, there's not like there's different parts of your mindset. I mean, if you want to go deep, I guess you can say that, but it's, it's all of it. Here's the key. Just having the awareness. People ask me all the time, why do you have such a great mindset? I, it's because I think about that all the time. I'm careful who I, you know, I'm aware of my environment. I'm aware of um, what's, what I'm listening to and stuff like that. Um, even if I'm with someone and it could be a friend of mine, it could be a colleague, anyone, if they're speaking negatively or, you know, trying to engage me in that conversation, I'll either walk away or I'll put my earphones in to listen to something that takes me out of it. Um, because here's the deal. I just don't like it. And it's, it's, it's just, whether it's talking behind someone's back or whether it's speaking negatively or, you know, people who complain all the time, I just, it drains me. And I'm allergic to cats. You know, if I had, if there was a cat in my office in, in my house right now, um, my whole face would be swollen. I would start sneezing. It, it's just really bad. I would take that any day than spending a day with a negative person, right? And I just don't like negativity. And, uh, and Tony taught me that, you know, because he doesn't like negativity either. I mean, I was with the guy for 10 years. I've never seen him upset um, for whatever reason, <laughs> you know, because he's conscious of, you know, he's aware of his environment and that's what he taught me. Be aware of your environment and adapt to your environment. You know, don't get angry in front of certain people and just, 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 you know, project good. And that's what I like to do. And uh, um, it works for me. It's part of my brand. It's part of who I am. Yeah. I, I love that, Reggie. All, all those points. Uh, are well, so isn't it tough? It's tough enough to, to, to achieve greatness surrounded by positive people in your life. I mean, think about that. It's, it's nearly impossible to do it with negative people in your life. You know, and, 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 and I don't say this in some cliche format. I mean, I, I'm for real when I say that. I do not like negativity. It's the only thing I do not like. <laughs> I, I completely agree. I've, you know, distanced myself from a lot of people and, and that. And, and I think Brent that works with you says a really good thing that he only has people in his phone that are over 85% optimistic. And he got that from me. I uh, did he? I did he? Yeah. Well, I, I thought that you know there was something going on there, but I'm calling Brent right after this. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't it true? Yeah, you have you have to let go. I don't. And when I say that I fire people in my life that are negative, I don't mean that literally. It's just that I don't spend a lot of time with them because we have negative people in our family. <laughs> I can't, you know, I can't fire my family. Um, luckily, I don't have any negative people in my family, but. There's people who are married to negative people. You know, how, how do you get out of that one? So, um, but I think, I, I think if you're in an environment where you can't separate yourself from that environment or that person, then that just means your awareness has to be even higher, right? And you have to filter out all the negative things that they're telling you. Uh, I think the worst thing a parent can do is, um, I mean, think of kids for a second. You want to know who has a good mindset? Kids kids have a great mindset. What happens if a kid tries to climb the kitchen counter and they fall? They, they will cry. First of all, if they fall, they're going to get back up and try it again. But if they fall and really hurt themselves and they start crying, they'll probably do it again because they want to accomplish that, right? Kids are so persistent. Kids don't understand the word no. They don't even know what the word no is, right? Definitely. But as they get older, who changes, their, who changes the kid's mindset? We yeah, do. We do. That's we right. do. Yeah. So, um, and, and that's why, you know, being a parent is a, is a big, big responsibility. I'm not one, but it's, it's a big responsibility. But if I was a parent, uh, I think I'd be a really good parent. <laughs> I think I'd be a really good dad. <laughs> because, uh, you know, the, the, I have good values. And um, just as the example I gave you, you know, Kids have a very good mindset. Kids don't know what the word no is. Um, kids are kind. Kids doesn't, you know, they don't know how to be mean. They learn that. They don't know how to hate. They learn that. And they learn it from adults like us. 
yeah, we've got to be so mindful. And I completely agree with all of what you said. And that's why with my partner, I bring her to all of the big events and things that I go to so that we are on the same page and we're, we're moving in the same direction. And I've had these conversations saying that, you know, kids, I read that, you know, from zero to six or seven years old, they're like sponges. So, you know, oh, absolutely. absolutely. And a lot of us, you know, we get a lot of our limiting beliefs, right? In that time, because of the things that our parents tell us. So if we're aware now of that, if we can feed them with all this positivity and basically have no limited beliefs, you're basically setting your kids up for massive success in, in whatever they want to do in life. Um, so and that's why I, I love my parents so much because my parents never, um, my parents, when I was growing up, they never told me what to do. They just always told me, whatever you do, be your best. Yeah. And that was the philosophy in my, in my, in my family when we were growing up. And, and you know, it, it's, how true is that? You know? And I'm fortunate because I know many parents don't say that or many people can't say they have the best parents in the world. But um, I was really fortunate and, uh, and it, it, it obviously paid off because I'm still using that same philosophy today. Yeah, I love that. That's very awesome. So um, what advice would you give people who want to become top speakers? People want to be top speakers. Well, you know, I, I say this, you, you just have to have a top brand. <laughs> you have to have a really, really strong brand, you know, and that's what JT talks about all the time. Here's the deal. You don't have to be the best at what you do. You just need to be branded as the best. I know a lot of speakers who are lousy speakers, but they're on stages every day, right? They have big events. I also know some speakers who are phenomenal speakers, but they can't get on stages or no one's asking them to, to speak or be a keynote or going to a corporate event and speaking. So I think you just have to have a really strong brand. It's no longer who you know, it's who knows you. And you have to build that brand, whether it's on social media, um, and you have to live up to that brand because you can't just say you wanna be a speaker but not have the, not do what speakers do. You know, and you can't, some people think they can just wake up one morning and be a speaker. I guess you can, because anyone can call themselves a speaker. Not everyone can call themselves an accountant. Not everyone can call themselves a doctor, but anyone can call themselves a speaker. And you just have to do what it takes. Um, uh, you know, one of our, Coach Cherie, I'm not sure if you know Coach Cherie, but she, she says, if you want to speak, if you want to become a speaker, then speak, make it happen. Yeah. I love that. And yeah, branding is so important. Like you said, I'm, I'm working a lot on that um, to, to really, um, you know, it's about positioning and about people knowing us. And, and I think um, the first time that I um, met you at, at JT's first event, and I remember I was, um, you know, I, I'd been successful in my, in my first business and I was like, I want to get into to coaching and mentoring. And you just told me, you're a coach and a mentor, Nate. Like, this is who you are now. Okay. So now we need to do the things to make that happen. Right. And then, Okay, now how do we build that brand? How do we build that belief? How do we build those skills and everything around that to, to sort of make that happen? And, um, and, and that's, you know, those little tweaks and those little things that you hear from, you know, your coaches and mentors can have massive differences. I, I still remember that, um, you know, to this day, Reggie. So that really sort well, of... How you show up, you know, it's also how you show up. It's how you behave. Yeah. And it's, it's how you speak. That's all part of your brand. I'm referring to the personal brand now because you need a personal brand as a speaker. You need a personal brand as an entrepreneur. You need a personal brand as a coach. Whatever you do, you need a personal brand. Teachers have a personal brand. And, it's, and that personal brand, what is a personal brand? It's what people say about you when you're not present. And um, I, you know, I think about that all the time. What do I want people to say about me when I'm not present? And that's how I have to behave. And um, you know, that's why I'm very careful what I say. I'm very careful what I do. Um, I want to be dressed appropriately. Um, I want to speak appropriately. I want to behave appropriately. That's all part of your brand. How you dress, how you look, what you say, who you hang around with, um, all of that. So it's really important. It's not just, you know, branding in a traditional sense, but it's also branding on you, yourself on how you behave. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I love that. Because um, if, you, if you screw that up, it's all over. True. And, and whatever it is, um, you know, it, it, it's, that's your brand. So whether or not you're early, whether or not you're late, you know, even just those little things, how you dress, um, you know, the way you talk, it's, um, yeah. It's, you know, first I wear a suit every day. Yeah. <laughs> even during COVID-19. Yeah. Yeah. I do a lot of these, you know, and, uh, and I, I do other stuff as well. And I, 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 I perform far better when I'm wearing this uniform, you know? So, uh, yeah, yeah. I and I wake up the same time 
you know, every morning that I did before this. Now, full disclosure, I did not do it the first couple of weeks because like everyone, I was trying to figure out what the heck was going on with this whole virus thing because we didn't know anything about it. And, and it concerned me because I was concerned about my, my, my family. Um, I'm not, I don't have those concerns now because we're all doing well. We're all very healthy and uh, we all communicate on, you know, my mom and I, we have dinner every week via Zoom. We have dinner together. So, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that you can do to still have the lifestyle that you had before COVID. But I think it's also a reminder that we need to step up our game. And because a lot of changes that we've made, um, or a lot of changes that I made since COVID, I should have made before COVID. So it just jolted me, you know. Uh, a lot of people who only had one source of income, it jolted them because maybe that source of income is gone. I made sure that I had all my... You know, I had everything ready, you know, so, uh, so I'm, I'm doing well. Yeah, no, that, that's really awesome, um, Reggie, and it's so important, um, you know, all of those things. So um, I guess, you know, a, a lot of uh, what I see in people at the moment now, because they're in different environments, especially when they're at home, is there's um, like, uh, actually, bef before I do that, I just want to say is I also dress up in a suit every day um, because I feel I get into the zone. So I just wanted to, to say that as well. Um, but, you know, when, I, when I'm coaching and mentoring people. By the way, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you what I'm wearing from my waist down. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's the beauty of being on a Zoom or whatever it is, isn't it? Um, Got to love it. Um, <laughs> um, so, yeah. <laughs> what I'm seeing with people is, you know, it's a challenge for them. Like I, I, I think for us, you know, we, we're sort of, um, we can move around a lot. So we're, we're easy working on a laptop and it's not much of a change, so to speak, um, working from home, but a lot of people that, you know, were, were in a, in an office and then having to work from home and, and doing things, you know, with how they're doing work. I think there's a lot of procrastinating that's happening. Um, so, you know, what quick strategy or something can they implement that, you know, they can really reach their peak, you know, performance like very quickly. Peak levels. Um, well, you know, I have, a, I have a routine that I do in the morning. You know, you, we have to take care of ourselves and we have to invest in ourselves. And, and, you know, some people, the first thing they do, they either turn the TV on or something like that. We know the first thing you do when you turn the TV on, it's all negative. Um, here, like on, on most of the news uh, channels here, in the top right corner, it tells you how many people um, have died from coronavirus. Yeah. Now imagine your kids turning the TV on and that's the first thing they see. It's, it's ridiculous. Why not put how many people have survived? Isn't that better? So maybe that's why I'm not in the news business. But I think what you have to do, um, you have to really, you have to be focused and you have to know what you're doing every single day. You know, every, every night before I go to bed, I make it a ritual to spend a couple of minutes to write down what I have to do the following day. Because if you do it when you wake up in the morning, you lose momentum. And, you know, when I wake up in the morning, I'm doing all of my exercise and all that stuff and getting myself together and then maybe listening to something to really help get me through the day. I still have to do that. I do that every single day, even on weekends. I put in my earphones and I do it while I'm in bed, I put on my earphones and I, and I just listen. Or um, I'm going to a webinar or something like that. A lot of them aren't all that great, but, you know, just like going to a grocery store, you're not going to get everything. You're going to get what you want. And, you know, and when you go to an event, that's the same way. You're not going to get everything. Just take what you want or what you feel would work for you, and then you leave. And, and, and so that's always been my philosophy. But just really having the focus and, and believing in yourself and knowing that you can do it. And I think that's the big part. Because even when you set goals for yourself, um, when I'm coaching someone, the first thing I do, I ask them what they want the first 90 days. And they struggle with that sometimes because they know what they want, but they can't write it down because they have a limiting belief that they're not going to be able to accomplish it. So, you know, you just can't think that way. And, and once you overcome that, like I said, and once you have an awareness of that, that's when the wall comes down. And not just the wall so that you can see clearly, but also the wall so that people can come into your life, right? because you start attracting the right people once you have that mindset. And, um, and, and, and it's a great thing. So there's not one or two things that you can do. There's, there's multiple things that you can do. But I think the, the first thing that's mo one of the most important things is to have the belief that you can actually do it. Because if you don't, then all the actions you do, you're, it, it's going to feel artificial. And it, it's almost going to feel like you're just doing it for nothing. And that's how most people give up. Yeah, no, they're, they're really awesome points. And 
And I guess that that segues in because um, you have an awesome book, um, (laughs) which I have right here, Uh, you know, the the mindset um, for success, um, you know, with, um, you know, developing and maintaining the mindset to succeed in life and business. So it's a really awesome book, Reggie. And and I know you you spent a while writing this book. Um, So please, um, you know, tell everyone what the book includes and, and what they'll get out of it. Well, you know, the book is not about me. It's about other people that I've, that I've been around. And, you know, I've always been fascinated. I've always been fascinated by um, people who are successful, but not, they're, not because they're successful, but the journey it took for them to become successful. And I'm not talking about the people who were born with it. I'm talking about the people who were in a situation where if you were to bet, whether they're going to be successful or not, that most people would say they would not be. Those are the stories that I like. Um, Oprah has a great story like that. Richard Branson has a you know, great story like that. Um, Ray Kroc from McDonald's has a great story like that. You know, the list goes on. You know, Coco Chanel has a story like that. The list goes on. That fascinates me because they had to have had a really good mindset. I mean, think of someone like Oprah. You know, all the things that she went through, she was molested, raped, whatever, um, told that she was ugly, told that she would never be anyone, got fired from her journalism job because she was told that she didn't look the part and that she was too caring about the stories that she was reporting. I mean, that's a heavy load, right? Now, if you knew Oprah at the age of 15, and let's suppose you were one of her best friends, and she looked at you and said, I'm going to be a billionaire by the age of 40. Would you believe it? No. I wouldn't either. And I have a pretty good mindset, but I probably wouldn't believe it because, you know, it's, it, and, and, and I don't like to say that, but I'm just, I'm just being honest, but you know who believed it? She did. And I tell people that's all it takes is for you to believe it. And um, there's, there's one thing that I have a problem with, and that's someone who has a goal. And just because we don't think they're going to be able to accomplish the goal based on our view of the world, even those who have done it, to tell them that they can't do it. I think that's the worst thing that you can do. Because you know what? For some people, their passion alone will get them there, right? And to tell someone they can't do that is the worst thing that that you can do. You're destroying someone when you tell them they can't do something that they have a desire to do. Definitely. Now, maybe you can help them on creating a better strategy to get there, but to flat out tell them that they can't do it. What if someone told me that I couldn't do it? You know, what if the position that I had at Tony Robbins when I was on the senior management team, what if someone told me that I couldn't do it? Yeah, that's... What if someone told Oprah that she couldn't do it? Or Richard Branson that he couldn't do it? Or what if Michael Jordan was told that he couldn't do it? And he did it. So I don't listen to that. And that just goes back to being around negative people. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's really awesome and, and amazing points. And, and I think like that, that key point that you said about is, do you allow it to affect you? Because I think we're always going to have people in our lives. Like even, you know, my, my teachers, my parents even said that I wouldn't be able to do certain things, right? Even when I was growing up and all our friends, it's like, oh, you can't do that. You can't do this. And it's but like, most of the time, what I understand is that when people say you can't do something or they react to something, it's actually a reflection of themselves because they think that it's too outside that it can't be done. So they, they, um, they put that on you. Um, and, you know, it's when you understand that and then at the same time, you think to yourself, um, is this person, does this person have the credibility and the skills to actually advise me on this? You know, are they successful in what I want to do? It's like, I want to start this big business and this person's never started a business. How can they tell you that you can't do it? Because they've got no experience, right? So that's that awareness thing back again. It's like, you know, who am I listening to? Um, You know, if I can't get away from certain people and saying, and, and I do it even... You know, even my parents, you know, to this day sort of say, is, oh, watch out about this or do that. I'm like, that's fine. I understand that you think that way, but this is the way that I think, right? And I put it on them so that I'm sort of changing their mindset. So I'm not letting that affect me at all, um, you know, in that sort of way. And that's, um, you know, really helped me um, in that way to really push forward. So exactly. thanks. Um, thanks. One of the things you're talking about, that's what inspired me to write the book because of uh, the experiences I've had um, with people who are, you know, wildly successful. And 
uh, and, and, the, and the, the, inter the interesting part is um, there's a lot of commonalities of people who are successful as far as what they do and their disciplines and the mindset and, and, and what they have to do to really make it happen. And one of the things that you have to accept is that you have to fail. You know, I say this all the time. If someone were to give you the playbook of success, the very first thing that would be in, in there is you must learn how to fail. But secondly, you must learn how to not repeat the same mistakes that led you to the failure initially. So that's, that's really, really important as well. And eventually, you're not going to fail. In, at, initially, you're going to minimize the failure. And then eventually, you're not going to have the failure at all. Yeah, no, I, I love that, Regina. They're great points. Completely agree with you there. So I remember meeting you at, at Mega Branding in um, you know, February 2019, and, and you, you captivated the room when speaking. Um, you know, you, you always emit a great energy on stage and, and have a natural talent in building deep connections and, and filling people with confidence, including me that day and the day after. Um, so for that, I, I'm very grateful for that. I think you were in the front row, weren't you? Were you in the front row? Sorry? No, 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 you weren't in the front row. I'm thinking about another event. Never mind. Go ahead. I know. That was the, the more recent one I was in the front row. That's exactly. when you, you were in Sydney just before COVID happened. Absolutely. And um, I remember that, that, was, that, was, that was great um, that, you know, I, I was still there. I wasn't, you know, putting into that. And, um, but then, yeah, I remember you guys had to cut off Perth out of the list. You were on the East Coast and then you, you flew back home basically after that. And that, that was the last trips that you guys did. So I was, I was grateful to see, um, you know, a lot of the key people um, in, you know, like yourself in, in JT's organization there. Um, so that was really awesome. So, um, yeah, I, so I, I, re I really thank you very much for your time today, Reggie. I'm sure many people have greatly benefited from, you know, your valuable wisdom. So how can people find you and get in contact with you? Well, I'm taking a little vacation. <laughs> <laughs> An undisclosed location. No, I'm just kidding. Um, they, they can go to, um, you, you know, go to my Instagram, which is Reggie Bats. I think that's the, the best place. That's where I'm the most active is on Instagram. And, um, you know, send me a message. I always respond to my messages. And, uh, you know, I love connecting with people. And I want to thank you for, you know, inviting me to be on, on your show. And I think that's great that you're doing it and uh, really talking about who you are and, and what you do and, and helping other people and bringing on you know, other coaches and mentors to share what they do to help your viewers. So I think it's wonderful. I'm going to start watching your show. Ah, awesome. Lovely. Thanks a lot, Reggie. Um, it's, it's great to hear. And um, yeah, and thank you everyone for watching and listening to this show, um, you know, where we talk about everything on business growth. Uh, you know, you can find me on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram as Ethan Cassiotis or visit my website, ethancassiotis.com. I completely agree with you, or do I? The only way you will know is if you tune in next time. So until next time, remember that our business grows when we learn skills and take action using them in spite of fear. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.